Hey, hey, gang, it's Dr. Mitch. I'm going to talk about marijuana subjective effects. I know this seems kind of ridiculous that like everybody should just know what the subjective effects are. But truth be told, once you break them down and once you try to separate expectancy from pharmacology, it's actually pretty interesting, pretty intricate literature. You're going to notice a recurring theme that what we think happens and what actually happens in the lab can sometimes be disparate. And that's really what we want to get into. And then my hope is by we looking at different uh, aspects of what people perceive, including time and space, uh, visual things, hearing things, we're going we're gonna to be able to catalog these in an intriguing way. And then as you might guess, these also link to, uh, indirectly at least, to people's strategies and, and uh, frequencies and quantities of use. So folks who have a more pleasant experience and who have fewer other pleasant experiences in their lives tend to use this more often or in, or in higher amounts. Well, first and foremost, we want to keep in mind that set and setting are always going to be an important contributor to most uh, psychoactive drug effects. And I wanted to remind us about the balanced placebo design. So Alan Marlatt, may his soul rest in peace, the guy who wrote the foreword to my book, Understanding Marijuana, he came up with the balanced placebo design and wrote a paper basically saying, look, this is what we need to do if we really want to say these are pharmacological effects and these are expectancy effects and they aren't confounded. So you can imagine a situation, we had done it with alcohol for years and years, but with cannabis or THC administered uh, by itself, where people are told, yes, you're getting it, or no, you're not, and they actually receive the drug, or they don't, but that these are manipulated orthogonally, so that there's a crew that uh, both gets told they're going to have cannabis and receives it, but then there's a crew that gets told they're going to have cannabis and they don't receive it. And that group that's told they got it but don't receive it, that's going to be a pure expectancy cell. The folks in that category are essentially going to be telling us what happens when you really only have the expectancy. In contrast, there are going to be folks who are told they don't have it, right? And either they really receive it or they really don't. And the folks... Uh, who really don't after they've been told they're not going to. That's just kind of our control group. But folks who are told they don't have it and we slip some THC on them, this may be a way to estimate pharmacological effects by themselves. All right? And we're going to get into some of that because obviously it's hard to fool folks at higher doses. But we'll at least keep these issues in mind when we're talking about subjective effects of cannabis or, or any drug. My take-home message, if you are going to take an exam in my class, is just that the fooled cells, right, the cells where I tell somebody one thing but present them with another, are going to be the ones that are often informative about either expectancy by itself or pharmacology by itself. And it's an intriguing way to measure subjective effects. So yeah, on this side, I'm saying self-report versus lab. The bottom line here is subjectives are inherently subjective. So um, some of you know my book, Mind Altering Drugs, The Science of Subjective Experience. And that, that title got me a lot of shit because people are like, well, how the hell is subjective experience a science? Well, we try to do our best to just get folks to report on their subjective experience. And based on that, uh, I've already done it with alcohol and we're making some strides with cannabis. You can predict somebody's patterns of use if they're at risk for problematic use, things like that, because of what they expect the drug to create. If you talk to some folks about cannabis and the way they uh, experience it, it's obvious that their delight is just so unparalleled, and it's not a surprise that they become frequent users. Obviously, outside the lab, we can't separate expectancy from pharmacology, and set and setting our really critical. So a lot of times when I hear about folks who've had an aversive experience with cannabis, it's either that the dosage was incredibly high or they were using it in a setting that was just clearly unfriendly or ill-advised. So uh, yeah, you don't want to eat a brownie inside uh, 
the the place where the police are or you know there're just certain settings where it's it's going to be less fun in contrast you might actually respond to a placebo very well if you're at a party where everyone else is high and really having a great time let's keep these in mind too when we're trying to make sense of the data that are presented because obviously not everybody did all four cells of the balanced placebo design and that some of these effects are primarily expectancy Others are primarily pharmacology. Well, one prominent subjective effect of cannabis is its impact on time. And if you recall from the hallucinogens le lecture, I don't really think time exists. Time is really just space. Time is essentially where are objects relative to each other. And that's how we measure time but that's not that time is a real thing we can point to so much as just differences in objects in space. Yeah, now you understand why that's part of the hallucinogens lecture. But truth be told, after cannabis consumption, time is perceived as slower. And it's curious because this is pretty similar to a lot of drugs of abuse, but it does raise the question, well, how do we even measure this? Everybody confirmed it on self-report. Oh, yeah. I watched a TV commercial and it seemed like it took 10 hours or, oh God, I was stuck somewhere at a funeral and it just went on and on because of the, the cannabis. Well, we've got a couple of different tasks. One is the time production task. So literally just ask folks, press a button, hit the space bar, and then when you think 30 seconds has passed, go ahead and hit it again, right? And invariably, folks hit it after just a few seconds because it seems like time is going slow. so slowly. This gets worse with the larger intervals, so 30 seconds is one. If I say do it for 10 seconds, folks aren't that bad. If I say do it for a minute, things really start to, you know, get disparate from what an actual minute is. Now, folks have said, well, isn't this a confound by... Uh, the impact on short-term memory, and we'll get to that. But the bottom line is, it's not that folks forgot to hit the button. In fact, it's that they're hitting it sooner. They're thinking, wow, man, this is this is just going on forever. Alcohol is similar. Um, Bill Lapp had some data with uh, Lorraine Collins suggesting that alcohol also makes uh, time go more slowly, and that may account for some of the odd effects of alcohol. So alcohol can be both uh, a happy drug and a sad drug, well, it's in part because time is going more slowly and you're attending to something positive, then of course alcohol seems like a delightful drug. But if time is going more slowly and you're attending to something negative, then of course you're going to cry in your beer. The other estimate of time perception is a time estimation. So literally just guess how much time has passed. So folks will consume THC in the lab, and after about 15 minutes has passed, the experiment will say, hey, how long do you think you've been here? And there are no clocks around or they're not allowed to look at their phones. Actually, most of this was done before everybody had a phone. And people generally estimate uh, somewhere around 25 to 30 minutes after a 15 minute time lapse. And truth be told, that's consistent with uh, a lot of the subjective reports. The subjective reports all started with Charlie Tart in 1971 when he was, I think, still at Stanford. And he just had a giant questionnaire that said practically every single thing that cannabis could do based on stuff he and a bunch of friends made up and essentially got to confirm some of these. But just because people say it doesn't hap happens doesn't mean it happens. In fact, we have replicated this one. The impact on time slowing does show up in the lab. Well, and then... As I'm joking around about time and space, of course, the next thing to discuss is space. And spaces are perceived as larger, but obviously this is confounded with time. So if you go for a walk and you feel like you've been walking for 40 minutes, then your estimate of how far you walked is obviously going to be markedly larger than it really is. But it's showing up in some curious other ways. So in Charlie Tart's data, the space between people, they talk about uh, when someone is sitting right across from you at the room, does it seem as if they're farther away and people tend to report yet yes um and this phantasmagoria as it's known is a an intriguing effect of a number of altered states of consciousness and not something that necessarily motivates use but something that people 
can savor relish and actually, uh, in so doing, uh, enjoy it and then end up actually using less cannabis. And so, yeah, anytime you're going to ask how far did you drive or how far have you walked, we do see folks tend to overestimate the space. And that driving literature is often uh, a whole other set of issues. But yes, people tend to overestimate how far they've driven if they've consumed cannabis recently. Well, so the world of vision is probably uh, a dominant one among at least Western cultures where we talk about how things appear. We use visual metaphors a lot in our language. Do you see what I'm saying? Um, those kinds, kinds of things. And it's curious because cannabis makes folks claim that they have these wild visual improvements, but the lab work is unable to confirm it. So, uh, Lots and lots of folks claim that using cannabis has enhanced their visual acuity. Uh, there's a wonderful case study about a guy who had greater depth perception after using cannabis. He was up in the mountains. He'd never really seen anything in 3D. He used some cannabis, and then suddenly the mountains snapped, literally popped into 3D for him. Now, this is a, a curious thing because we train our brains to see in 3D when we're really, really young. And Occasionally, there'll be folks from other cultures who uh, live in the forest and don't often see, uh, say, mountains from a long distance. And so then they have to deal with that and kind of train their own brains. If they'll see somebody far away on a mountain, they think that person is little, right? They haven't, they haven't actually had that experience to learn that up. And it looks like cannabis creates a comparable uh, opportunity to sort of learn again what you're seeing and how to translate it into a third dimension. So folks are uh, claiming that they have greater depth perception and enhanced look acuity. Now, um, it's curious because this may actually be true if folks have glaucoma, if they've got a serious problem with the pressure inside their eyes and they go ahead and use cannabis and decrease that pressure then what, what a surprise, they can essentially see a little bit better, but it's because of the medicinal effects of the cannabis. In contrast, if you just ask folks who don't have any kind of eye abnormalities to uh, take an eye test, use cannabis and take an eye test again, we don't see the enhanced acuity, even though everybody claims it. Now, are there hallucinations on cannabis? Rare and only at high doses. So, uh, you know, if you're going to listen to Dark Side of the Moon with your eyes closed, I know I'm dating myself here, but uh, you will get some visual apperceptions. You'll get perceptual aberrations. But the idea that you're going to smoke cannabis and suddenly see a penguin standing over there is is not something that folks <laughs> report often, even at, even at dramatically higher doses than uh, most folks would say are enjoyable. All right? So with vision... We do hear subjective impressions of enhanced acuity and greater depth perception. We don't see this in the lab work, and hallucinations are incredibly rare and only at high doses. Visual hallucinations. Now, what's funny is this literature on imagined images. So if you can essentially talk about how well can you envision a square. If I say, hey, envision a square. Some folks claim they're really good at that. Some folks claim they're not, and that cannabis tends to improve their ability. So if you take a second and say, okay, here's, you know, the platonic form of the square. I can see it right now. Generally, the lab work has a hard time with this because how do I measure what's going on inside your head? But the descriptions of the images were judged as less vivid when folks were asked to describe what it was that they were imagining in response to a prompt. Now, obviously, this is in some ways confounded by their ability to articulate what it is that's going on inside their heads. So I don't take this literature too seriously. Um, oh, my mom had an MFA. Like, if you know any artists who uh, will talk about their cannabis experiences, they all claim that they can get this image in their minds and it works out very nicely 
The alleged impacts of cannabis on creativity may be related to this. So the self-report of uh, what you can imagine as a visual image in your mind is enhanced. Lab work is struggling to try to replicate that or confirm it. Then color perception. So self-reports on color perception, people claim they can find very intriguing appreciation for subtle distinctions of different colors. And if you've ever done any of those tests on the internet, there's one where uh, if you can't see certain forms of red, you can't see these letters, but if you can, then you see a word written out. And man, I can't do it at all. And my daughters can both see it fine. Like I have no idea what's going on, but it's a good lesson for, hey, some people see things you don't see. And I think what happens is essentially the positive affect, the appreciation for it may be taking over because in the lab work, we actually see less accurate color perception. So folks will uh, present uh, two sides, they're slightly different colors, and the folks who've used cannabis are less good at distinguishing between them. And you know, in order to control for people just saying, oh yeah, it looks like two to me, occasionally they have the same one presented twice. It's, it's an astounding process. There are cultures too that can see shades of green that often folks in the US cannot see Evolutionarily, you know, we got a big mythological story about that, but the, the bottom line is these are fun to find out about. And if you get a minute to check on the web to, to uh, test color perception, by all means, check out your own. But cannabis's impact on it is not something that we can confirm in the lab. And it looks like on the blue end of the spectrum, cannabis actually makes fine distinctions among colors more difficult. Uh, the depth perception I mentioned when we were talking about space, uh, yeah, a lot of folks report that this is enhanced in the lab work, it says no. Uh, generally, if you've ever been to Disneyland or Disney World where you see those crazy illusions that can look like they're jumping out at you or, or uh, going into the wall uh, in the line for the Haunted Mansion, they have some of these. And uh, folks have to report when it does have that or when it really doesn't and they don't seem to catch all the ones that actually do have that quality. So the lab work is saying, hey, we don't really have this enhanced depth perception, even though we think we do. Ah, Pierre Gaultier. So this is one of the poets at the Hashish Club. And, uh, you know, in the mid 1800s, the Hashish Club was all those French uh, guys hanging around with Moreau and eating hash and having parties and, you know, everybody claimed everybody else ate it, but nobody ate it themselves. Uh, truth be told, Gautier wrote some intriguing poems about hearing and even uh, wrote in his diary once that he was hearing certain bells being played uh, after consuming cannabis. I cannot imagine... Uh, you know, it's just so far from most people's experience, but he seemed to really like it. And then the Frank Herbert wrote a thing in Dune where a character has a drug that does this and then he has to take an antidote. Um, so it's, it's intriguing that this was probably uh, an expectancy effect at the time and the French were really relishing music at the time. Um, and if you see Gautier's work, by all means, give it a read. So what does seem to happen when the hearing literature is uh, Tart's, Charlie Tart's data suggests that people think they understand lyrics better, right? Now, in the early 70s, what were the lyrics like? That's an interesting question to ask. But even, you know, uh, later rap songs, uh, you, you can't have a much better understanding of Slap My Bitch Up. There, there are certain lyrics that just don't lend themselves to this. But some lyrics are just ambiguous enough and I feel like a lot of the most successful songs in pop culture are ambiguous enough so it's about whatever you're thinking about right then. And people claim they have a novel insight into what those lyrics mean. It's not really hearing so much as understanding. And everybody claims enhanced acuity, particularly with the perception of location. So I can tell a, a, a noise is coming from over there. Oh, that bird was behind me. This one was... Uh, in front of me to the left, this one, and that 
may be confounded with those same perceptions of 3D, but I, I find it uh, delightful that people think that the lab work, it's not that it gets worse, it's just it's, it's not confirming. And then, as you can imagine, there's not a fun, lot of funding for this kind of uh, research, so we may be in the dark on some of this. And then it does make me want to bring up the notion of synesthesia, and we did talk about this with the hallucinogens as well, but synesthesia is essentially confusing one sense for another. So uh, oh, the classic story I tell is um, someone handing someone some peanut butter and saying, here, feel this, right? The, the idea that uh, certain sensations that normally go to one sense get confused with another. So some folks have this as a neurological disorder. There was a guy who claimed every time he ate beef, he could feel these red uh, cold bars up against his the back of his arm, right? So uh, an odd kinesthetic confusion with a gustatory taste, right? And so when different stimuli are processed differently like that, we call it synesthesia. And apparently at high doses, cannabis does this. So the I see music, um, oh, <laughs> yeah, I have a story about that where someone was clinking some glasses and uh, she said, it smells like bells, right? Obviously, it sounded like bells. I don't know if she was actually having an olfactory hallucination uh, or just couldn't think of the word sounds, but this is uh, apparently a widely reported subjective effect, at least in 1971. All right, with that in mind, I'm going to stop here and I'll wrap this up on the second post. I really appreciate everybody listening to this. If you have any questions, do listen to the second half and then go ahead and post any questions you might have. Really appreciate you guys being flexible and I'll put the other one up in a minute.